let's get um, started so hello and welcome to the skype webcast uh today we're fortunate to be chatting with jean francois uh Esculier, uh who is an expert on running injuries and um, he's a clinician he's a researcher at laval university and he's a tutor on the hugely popular running course called the new trends in the prevention of running injuries all over the globe so uh, how are you jf how, how are you today I'm good, thank you. How are you, Ben? Yeah, I'm good, good, and thanks for agreeing for the webcast. You must be really tired after the weekend course. How how was the course? Yeah, it was a great course. Actually, it's a it's a pretty long course. It's uh, from eight a.m. to six p.m. Yeah, uh, Saturday and Sunday, a lot of uh, stuff to cover. Yeah, it's always great to uh, to have uh, those clinicians uh, in the course and uh, explore all the science and the practical aspects. Yeah, I, I'm, I was always surprised. Like, how do you keep them really on for the whole two days? You know, how do you keep them <laughs> involved? It's a, it's a good mix of uh, of theory and practice. So yeah. as soon as you know we've had like one hour of theory, uh, we get up and we do some practical stuff. Uh, either trying uh, uh, running gait uh, analysis on people or. Uh, doing different tests on uh, running biomechanics or uh, drills, uh, that kind of stuff. Okay, that's good. Uh, so for our listeners, you know, because I've been following your work for a while, could you tell us a little bit of yourself and especially about the running-related research you're involved in? Yeah, so uh, actually from my background, I, I graduated from the University of Ottawa uh, in physiotherapy mm -hmm. and then went back to uh, to the clinic uh, in Quebec City, where, I, where I'm from originally okay and I'm working in a clinic uh, right now I'm, I'm part-time in the clinic mm. but uh, I used to work uh, full-time there mainly with uh, with runners I would say that even right now my caseload is uh, probably around 75 per um, mm. so after that I decided to go uh, do graduate studies okay I, uh, did a master's in um, it's called experimental medicine basically okay. a project uh, about the publications that we will discuss later on. Yeah. Uh, analysis of uh, biomechanics in the lab, uh, patophomol pain versus uh, healthy subjects. Yeah. Uh, in runners, obviously. Yeah. And doing also an intervention program. So that was my, my master's. And then I currently doing a PhD on, uh, it's the following uh, project. So basically we, we base our, our project, it's an RCT. You okay. We are doing that on the previous project. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, clinical and research-based work as well, isn't it? So you're linking up yes. both. So uh, let's get started straight away in some clinical scenarios. So the first one which I'm going to address is the petal femoral pain. As you know, it's a number one reason people come to us, you know. A uh, lot of uh, common, but still it's not easy. It's multifactorial. And there is different ways of looking at it. So I try to keep it simple. So looking at uh, purely as an over overuse, something like a load issue, uh, looking at biomechanics, looking at the hip stability, uh, you know, cord weakness or distal factors or looking into lower limb kinematics such as overstride or excessive hip, hip abduction. So as, as you can see, it's quite confusing with so many variables. So uh, if you get a runner in your clinic, so what are the key subjective and objective markers which will guide your clinical reasoning and management plan? Yeah, that's a very good question, Ben. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm focusing a lot on subjective for yeah. assessment of a runner with yeah. adult mobile. And I always start my assessment by asking, did you change something recently? Because for me, clinically, um, people who develop a running injury, 75% of the time, at least, they had changed something recently in their training. Either they increased their running volume, distance, weekly mileage, uh, they increased their running speed, they added speed intervals, yeah. uh, they added some downhill or running uh, uphill. Uh, mostly downhill for patophomal pain. They change their shoes. They change the way they run. Yeah. They change something. They can be more fatigued. They can take new medication. Whatever. Yeah. Most of the time, they change something. And because the body is so well done, that I'm pretty sure that if you don't change anything, even yeah. if your biomechanics are not perfect, yeah. you will not get injured. Yeah. So for this person, I always ask, "What did you change recently?" Because most of the time, this is an overload issue. Yeah, okay. And after that, for the objective assessment, yeah, uh, I I don't I don't do like uh, static uh, measurements like what is the foot type, uh, what is uh, the Q angle like, static Q angle. This is anatomy. Um, the person is is used to this. There's according to what I think, there's no real reason why a runner would get injured at 45 years old. Developing patophomal pain. Yeah, 
because of a flat foot mm. and they've had flat foot forever. Yeah. So based on that, I'm I'm really uh, I'm I'm really a believer of the capacity of the body to adapt. Yeah. If your your anatomy is this way, mm. you're fully adapted to this. Yeah. So objectively, I I will for sure assess uh, more functional tests. Yeah. So yes, I will go into all the step down uh, single leg squat to look at what's the control like. Yeah. Um, even though, according to the research we have right now, uh, control might not be necessarily the cause of an impaired control. Yeah. And not the cause of pedophimal pain, but maybe a consequence, just like yeah. muscle weakness um, that was uh, discussed by uh, Michael Ratliff yeah. and, uh, and his colleagues in uh, BGSM. Yeah. So, I, and after that, I move on to running gait analysis. Mm. And, uh, running gait analysis, I'm looking for sure for all the factors that are overloading maybe the patophimal joint yeah. uh, that maybe I can modify either on the short term or mm. on the long term if, if maybe it's better uh, on the longer run. Yeah. Uh, but like uh, impact forces, vertical loading rate, uh, what's the step frequency like, yeah. uh, foot strike pattern and so on. Yeah. Uh, as we know, patellofemoral is not a homogeneous group. You know, there's a lot of subgroups. And we know from, we know from the research that it's quite high in women and in novice runners, you know. And there are sort of distinct um, reasons in women, such as, you know, a decreased glute meat activation, early glute max fatigue, uh, excessive hip abduction. So what are your thoughts on, uh, because I get a lot of female runners. So do you think we should be targeting female runners differently? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm wondering also if uh, female runners do not, like, seek medical advice more than male runners. Okay. Uh, in my practice, I, I would say that it's probably equal, men mm. and women. Mm. What I see, and maybe it's different from one uh, one place to another. Yeah. Um, and even when I send out uh, publicity for research projects, yeah. yes, I get more female runners mm. uh, answering to, the, uh, to the, uh, the ad, but I get a lot of male runners. Okay. So based on that, I'm for the just the number and the prevalence and so yeah. on, I'm... I'm not so sure there's a so huge difference, but mm. there might be a difference, yes. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the distinct biomechanical differences? Are they important? Like the especially yeah, gait thing? I don't think that we, we need to focus necessarily on that. Mm. And especially because all the research that we have right now are not prospective, they're cross-sectional. Yeah. Except basically one study by Brian Noren. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, with some, uh, I have some reserve about uh, about the methodology. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but basically, um, it's cross-sectional, so we have no idea if it's a cause or a consequence. Okay. I, I'm always addressing what I see at this time. So yes, I will address the mechanics at that time when I see the runner. Yeah. But uh, is it the different, especially for women or for mm. men? Mm. Uh, I would not say that it's a specific trend that we have to go a specific way. From okay. from my opinion. Okay, uh, I think we can jump straight into one of the article which I really enjoyed reading was the where he looked at um, it's published in the Gait and Posture where he looked at twenty runners with patellar femoral pain and twenty um, control, and uh, you hypothesized that there should be some difference between the lower limb strength between the runners as well as the non-runners. Uh, but the interesting thing was there's hardly any difference between the strength between the runners with pain, uh, knee pain, and without them. Were you surprised by the results? And how do you explain that lack of difference? Yeah, it's, a, yeah, hmm? it's an interesting question. Hmm. Uh, if you look at the literature right now, most of the studies say there is a difference hmm. uh, between controls and uh, runners with patophenol pain mm. and I, I was a little bit surprised yes mm. because I use the same methodology of uh, isometric testing the same position as yeah. other studies um, so yes I was I was surprised by the results mm. how do you explain that how do you what do you think how do you explain that uh, subtle things it, how do I explain the results I mm. get is um, is that probably this kind of testing is mm. maybe not the best way of testing, uh, you know, strength. Mm. It's not functional for, mm. for runners, that yeah. not, especially the positions for testing hip external rotators. Mm. Um, so 
basically, I, I think that it might not reflect necessarily necessarily the reality that mm. the strength they need to do their function. Mm. So that's one thing, mm. and maybe it's more a question of endurance rather than strength sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we just wanted to compare with other studies, so that's mm -hmm. why we use the same method. Yeah, I'm just going to pick up two points which I really found interesting was generally we know that high impact loading is linked with a lot of injuries. But what I found interesting was in your study, like uh, it was noted, the runners with petal femoral pain had lower ground reaction forces. You know, that was really surprising. So they had less ground reaction forces, which is against conventional wisdom. Like you see work from Iron Davies and colleagues where they showed there's a high impact loading. So do you think it's a protective strategy by injured runners? Definitely, yes. Mm. Uh, if, you, if you read the paper, um, we hypothesize that this might be a protective strategy based on also the EMG data that we had. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at the EMG data in this group of runners, they had a higher soleus activation. Okay. Uh, so if you link clinically, if you want to, to, to have a runner reduce the load at the knee, mm. um, then you have to activate more distally the muscles to to absorb the impact so that there's less impact left to the knee, right? Mm. So um, by having more activation from the soleus, mm. uh, we hypothesize that this might be a protection strategy to reduce the load directly mm. at the knee. There's been a lot of interest on the importance of soleus and, uh, you know, which is normally ignored because mainly it's the cough. Do you sort of include a lot of soleus strengthening sort of in your rehab element of your runners? Uh, not that much. Mm. I aim more for... Um, I would say activation during the task mm. uh, because uh, as just uh, as an apart to this um, research right now suggests that uh, strengthening or control exercises might be more uh, task specific. Okay. So basically, if you strengthen the muscle uh, and aim for I don't know reduced uh, hip adduction when mm. you run, you strengthen the glute med. Yeah. Uh, it not transfer according to what we have right now it will not transfer to the task of running mm. so you will not have a decrease um a decreased hip a deduction necessarily mm. so based on that i do not focus on soleus strengthening mm. i will modify the the, the gate uh, the gate pattern running gate pattern mm. to activate more the soleus during running mm. yes Mm. But not focus on a non-task specific, so not uh, exercises. Specific. Yeah, and uh, other thing was, you know, the cadence. You know, people generally say the cadence is reduced in people with knee pain or in injured. But in your group, there was hardly any difference between the cadence. Both was around 170 mark. So, do you think is, is it cadence so important as people say? I, I think cadence is important. Mm. Uh, Again, I'm a firm believer of the adaptation. So if you're fully adapted to a cadence of 160 and you, you never had any problems, mm. uh, I would not necessarily change it. Mm. Uh, if you have a cadence of 170 and have knee pain, mm. so that's your baseline, mm. I will increase your cadence to decrease the load at the knee to allow your knee to start the healing process and, you know, to... Uh, uh, to, to start uh, the rehab. Yeah. If you have already a cadence of 180, yeah. let's say, and you have knee pain, mm. uh, I might also increase slightly the cadence, but I will probably uh, like focus more on other, uh, other factors of the running game. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, going into the management, as we know that multimodal rehab is generally considered effective, and you must have looked into the recent best practice guidance by Christian Barton and group where they looked into you know, a lot of uh, tailored multimodal approach. One of the things which the guidelines said was a lack of consensus among the experts about gait retraining. So that's why I really liked your latest, uh, not still, is it published or on the way to be published, the one on the Journal of Sports and uh, Rehabilitation, um, which you, you had sent over, the effects of a multimodal rehab protocol. Um, yes. Mm. It's uh, it's accepted for publication. It was uh, put on PubMed, so mm. the abstract is on PubMed since March mm. uh, of this year of 2015. Mm. Uh, but the, the journal is uh, is just very late in uh, in uh, editing this version. So I'm still waiting for the proof. Yeah. But if uh, if clinicians want to see the paper, it's available uh, on my research gate profile. Okay. No yeah. Thanks. So uh, the one thing which I interesting was you used a lot of. You know, you used uh, education, you used strengthening, motor control, as well as running retraining, which is more pragmatic because you do see studies where they just focus on one area, isn't it? Just uh, gait retraining or strength. 
in theory, I like to embrace all the four areas because they're equally important, isn't it? So, um, and the good thing was you had improvement in nearly uh, 16 out of 21 runners. And again, you didn't have any strength changes uh, before and after. So, is it fair to say that you don't necessarily need to have strength improvement to have decrease in pain? I would definitely say that. Mm. Um, again, it's uh, for me in this study, and uh, we'll talk further about this, mm. I'm pretty sure, but um, unloading or uh, decreasing the load specifically at the knee will allow the knee to get better. Okay. Even if you don't have more strength, even if you don't have a, a change necessarily the hip kinematics. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say that you do not necessarily need uh, higher strength hmm. uh, in the glutes muscle or in the quad to get better. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, education is a key component uh, which you uh, put a lot of emphasis in your article. So you mention a lot about decreasing daily distance, reducing speed, downhill running. So for our, uh, for our listeners, could you please elaborate on the specific advice you give to your runners, especially with patellar femoral pain? Because that's yes. important. It is important. It mm. is the key factor, actually. Mm. Uh, mm. For me, in the clinic, when I see a runner with patellar pain, mm. yes, I will give them exercises. Yes, I will do running gait retraining. Mm. But the most important thing is education. Yeah. Even if you run better, mm. even yeah. if you do exercises, if every time you go out for a run, mm. you go all out and you uh, you hit your knee, mm. uh, you will not get better. That's yeah my opinion. Mm. So what I say to me to my patients is, uh, and that's the, the exact same protocol that we use in the study, yeah. is when you go out for a run, your level of symptoms might reach, for example, average people 2, 3 out of 10, okay. no problem. When you go back, uh, you're back home, your pain has to go back to your pre-running level mm. within, within 30 to 60 minutes maximum. Okay. And the day after, you have to be uh, no, no worse compared with the day of your training. Mm. So basically, your body will tell you if you go too far. Mm. And that's the key thing for me. Mm. Um, the other thing about education, I, yeah. will do, I will manage your training loads, that's for sure. Yeah. You want to reduce the stress at the, the load at the, at the knee, the pedophimal joint, you have to run slower, slightly slower. Yeah. Let's say you, you're running at uh, typically 12 kilometers per hour. Yeah. I will reduce that to 11 or to, to 10 temporarily, that's yeah. for sure. I will advise you not to run downhill because you have increased patellar stress when you do that. Yeah. Stress with load, sorry. Uh, and also, I will uh, have you to do run walk intervals uh, at different points in your training. Yeah. It might be four minutes run, one minute walk, it might be nine one, and some people might even be two one. We play with that, we personalize that. Yeah. And um, the other thing that we do is uh, if you, for example, you run currently uh, three times uh, five kilometers in your week, yeah. I will spread that out through your week, mm. so you five times three kilometers. Yeah. So basically, every time you you still stress your body, mm. you give load to your body, you allow your body to adapt. Mm. But every time you go out for a run, mm. you hit uh, to uh, and a low, with lower forces uh, on it. Yeah. Do you encourage uh, days of cross training, you know, something like cycling or swimming in between to reduce the load? Is this something you give us an advice as well? Yes, uh, mm. definitely. I, I would. Mm. Uh, maybe in earlier stages, but as soon as they can, uh, you know, have a, a decent uh, running training, mm. I would uh, keep the running training and they, they can do cross training if they want, but it's not mandatory. Okay. And uh, now looking into gait retraining in your article, there are a lot of options. One option is to increase the cadence. Normally, people use it between 5 to 10 percentage. Uh, other option is modifying from a heavy heel strike to more a midfoot pattern, uh, landing closer to the center of mass. So there's a lot of uh, options we've got here. And uh, so how do you decide? And another one is uh, reducing the noise, so the reducing impact loading as well. Do you tend to implement all the three or four, or how do you decide which is the most important for that runner? Yeah, very good question. The um, For me, cadence is uh, is one big thing okay I, I this is the intervention i use the most between those three mm. um, and uh, so uh, typically i use a combination of three interventions either only one or in combination mm. that would be increased cadence and it can be five percent can be ten percent it can be uh, different in some other people yeah uh, i will ask them to run softer if i can hear that they run very hard that's mm. for sure so yeah it depends on that person 
and uh, I will also use um, the uh, the advice to which it was not in the paper, but to uh, modify the shoes. Yeah. Um, before asking them to mid foot strike, mm. because for me, if you feel more the ground, and we'll talk about that later with the, the minimalist index. Yeah. But if you feel the ground better, mm. you will tend to have typically less vertical loading rate, less ground reaction forces. So you'll, you'll uh, make sure that you don't hit too hard. Yeah. Uh, so clinically, I use cadence, which is my favorite. Yeah. Second, with change in shoes mm. or, um, you know, trying barefoot and uh, in that kind of, uh, of drills. Mm. And then I use the run softer. And I keep the modify, uh, modified foot strike pattern for the end. Mm. The reason why is um, people tend to overcorrect that. Yeah, okay. If you tell a runner, uh, don't strike with your heel or run on the, on the ball of your, uh, of your foot, yeah. uh, they will tend to overcorrect to be toe strikers and mm. never touch the, the ground with the, the heel. And they will develop uh, very quickly pain to their their calves, their foot, and the, the risk of injury for me with that intervention is higher than okay. other injuries. Okay, and uh, as you can see, there's a lot of ways of doing it practical. I tend to use sometimes metronomes, give them uh, mirror uh, retraining, sometimes give them uh, uh, you know auditory cues like take short, quick steps, something like that. So, what are the specific cues and the training methods you use to? Uh, for example, improve cadence or modifying your heel strike. Well, how do you do that practically? Yeah, so cadence, uh, I use metronomes a lot. Mm. Uh, I use them in the clinic. Um, when runners go back home, mm. they can have uh, applications on, on their uh, on their phone if they run with music. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. I use a lot the metronome. Okay. That's my favorite one. Mm. Uh, I also use for some people um, visual, more visual feedback. Mm. Uh, if they run on a treadmill, uh, let's say I'm aiming for 180 uh, cadence. Mm. I'll have them to look at the seconds passing by, and every second, every second they have to do three steps. Okay. Uh, that's another thing I use mm. for the run softer. It's mm. much easier to do that on the treadmill at first. Mm, yeah. Because outside, when running over ground, it's it's harder to to hear. Mm. Um, so these are the main uh, main cues that I will use. Um, and we didn't talk, and in in my paper, we didn't focus on anything about uh, running kinematics, yeah. like uh, other studies have done, um, like uh, Rich Willie's studies yeah. uh, with uh, the mirror, yeah. uh, Ryan Noren with the, the, the 3D kinematics yeah. uh, feedback. Uh, I don't use that, I well, almost never use this in the clinic because I find that uh, working with the kinematics, people tend to not be as comfortable as working more with cadence. Yeah. So I don't use the mirror and uh, yeah, so focus more on metronomes, mm -hmm. uh, the noise, and uh, and uh, that's pretty much yeah. it. Yeah. And there's a lot of debate in the literature on external cueing and internal cueing. For example, is it better to say run soft or to uh, or to say make less noise, you know, sort of cues. You know, do you think that works, works differently in different people? You know, the cues. It is. It, mm. it does. Yeah, it works differently in different people. Mm. And some people will just never be able to run softer or to make less noise when they run. Mm. Uh, and for some of them, the best solution is you take off the shoes mm. and you run barefoot and they will automatically do it. Mm. Uh, so I use more afferent feedback mm. uh, like this from the feet. Mm. I use that a lot. Mm. And clinicians should try that. You have a runner on the treadmill, they ha they make a lot of noise when they run. Mm. They have a of 155, let's say, a okay. uh, huge steel striker, mm. you take off the shoes and the typical response will be an increase of minimum 10, let's say average uh, around 12 to 15 steps per minute mm. directly. Mm. I said nothing. Mm. I keep uh, the speed at the, uh, the treadmill at the same speed. I say nothing and they increase their cadence. They do less noise and um, they change their foot strike pattern. They have a lower um, foot to ground angle uh, when they strike. Mm. So, for me, if it's not working with the run softer, yeah. I use barefoot a lot, and this this gives me an indication that I will go to minimalist shoes with them. Yeah, so it sort of gives you an indicator that might be the way forward, isn't it? Sort of. Yes. Yeah, and um, uh, the key thing is running. Return to running after injury is always a bit tricky because if you uh, get them back too soon, then it could lead to flare up. And if you get them too long, then you get a frustrated runner. So it's always very difficult to find the balance. So um, what's your clinical criteria on return to running in an injured runner? Sort of what are, what are the things you look for? Uh, are you talking more about specifically patellofemoral yeah, pain? Pe yeah, patellofemoral pain, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
if it's really, really uh, flared up, mm. uh, I, I will stop them sometimes for one week, two weeks. It happens. Mm. But most of the time when I see them, it's more chronic type. Mm. For my clientele, they're more uh, persistent pain, uh, mm. at least two, three months, even sometimes uh, 10 years. Mm. Um, so I, I don't stop them at that time. I want to promote adaptation. Okay. So if it's an acute injury, I will protect. Mm. I will offload during certain period of time mm. to allow the body to start the healing process. Just as we see uh, if it's chronic, the best treatment is to load it. So okay. for me, uh, yeah. loaded, but you know, less, sometimes less um, intensity. So yeah. that's what I use for, for my runners. I have them to keep running and mm. sometimes I have them to increase their weekly mileage, yeah. but to spread it. If mm. they run only twice a week, they'll run four times a week, mm. uh, but less at, uh, at, every, uh, at every run. Mm. So I typically don't stop them, but I will manage with their symptoms uh, and, uh, and the load during the week and cross training sometimes. Yeah. And do you sort of agree with that 10 percentage rule of increasing the distance, which be many coaches use that? Is something which you think is... Uh, uh, it's a it's a good one to use, you know the mileage. Is, mm. uh, yeah, it's a, it's a no brainer. It's a very easy uh, rule to remember. Mm. Uh, when I give public lectures, I most of the time use the ten percent because it's easier for people to, you know, to to remember. Mm. But uh, in the clinic with my patients, um, I don't necessarily use the ten percent. Mm. It might be twenty percent in some people, even thirty percent, depending yeah. on of that uh, of that runner mm. um, recent studies uh, suggest that even if you have a uh, 20% increase you're not more at risk yeah uh, studies, uh, by uh, Rasmus Nielsen yeah so it's interesting that in some people it can be 5% increase per week and some others can be up to 20 or even 30% so mm. I adapt always to the level of symptoms mm. and the patient can auto regulate their increase based on their symptoms that's yeah. my key auto um, the people they they take care of themselves yeah and do you think the experience has a huge role in that you know you get an experienced runner like five years or seven years who's run a lot is that easier do you think rather than, than a novice runner to increase faster yes, yeah definitely mm -hmm. yes uh, and most of the time they they know better about their body yeah. and uh, most of the time, if they're experienced, I'll have them to increase faster. Yes. Yeah. So I think, you know, keeping our time relevant for the clinician, we try to cover a lot of areas. So if you get like a, a, a new and a relatively a new therapist who's just getting into uh, uh, dealing with runners uh, with petal femoral pain, what would you say is the top three tips for a therapist to be aware of or something uh, to be, you know, make sure that they don't miss out if you if you want to say to a junior therapist or somebody like that? What would you yes. say? My first point would be education, that's mm. for sure. Mm. So in the treatment, if you don't address that, you will not succeed yeah. or you will have a high recurrence rate. Yeah. I want my patient to understand what they have, so I educate them on all the training loads aspect that we've talked earlier. Mm. That's my number one. Mm. Number two uh, would be uh, exercises mm. because I give a lot of exercises to increase capacity, not necessarily to increase strength but to increase the capacity of the tissues okay. to sustain the load mm. so the uh, it can be strengthening exercises can be control exercises mm. uh that's for sure and my third thing would be uh running gait modifications okay so uh, i running gait retraining so i will look at all we've talked so cadence run softer and uh basically um the the shoes or you know uh the change in foot strike patterns sometimes mm. Uh, on my number four, I would add ask uh, add to that the taping okay. that I use a lot. Yeah. Uh, is it for the petal femoral one? You know, is that the one you use for that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I use for uh, petal femoral pain. I use a, a very simple uh, taping, uh, and I refer them to a video that we have uh, the clinic on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, they do that on themselves uh, with uh, neuroproprioceptive taping. I don't use the mechanical tape. Yeah. Uh, Personally, because yeah. I, I feel that I have the same effect and it's more comfortable with the newer properties of the thing. Yeah. Uh, thanks, JF. The, you, you covered a lot of uh, great clinical tips, which I'm sure anyone dealing with uh, running injuries would have a lot of uh, useful information there. So, where can the listeners find out more about you and especially about the courses if they want to get in touch or something? Sorry, can, uh, I missed that. With, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if listeners want to know more about you and the courses, uh, where is the best way for them to know about all the all the good research you do and all the sort of information? Yeah. yeah so, um, 
the uh, our our website our organization's website is theRunningClinic.com. dot com. Mm. Uh, so for sure, they they can have a lot of different informations on the courses mm. on this website. A lot of educational uh, tools yeah. for clinicians for patients. Uh, it's it's a very popular website. We put on information on running shoes also. Okay. Uh, we're gathering information on the running shoes minimalist index, and we put that on the website and so on. So that's for the courses. And for uh, the research that I do, uh, obviously, uh, my research gate profile is uh, is the best place to go. Mm. So I put all the papers that I can because mm. obviously there are copyrights sometimes. Yeah. So I put that on, and they can follow me on Twitter. And uh, what's your handle? What's your Twitter handle? Twitter is uh, at JF. SQDA. Okay, I'll put the link on the show notes as well uh, below okay. that. So thanks, Jeff, for the time. And we're going to go in the next section. We're going to talk about a little bit more controversial, talking about minimalistic shoes, foot strike, and everything. So thanks for the time, and we really appreciate for uh, taking time from a busy schedule. Thanks. Yep. We'll be looking at some of the literature which is mentioned in the webcast. The first article is, um, which is published in the Gait and Posture Journal looking at lower limb control and strength in runners with and without patellar femoral pain syndrome. So it's comparing 20 runners with patellar femoral pain versus 20 controls. All were recreational runners. This is the first study which looked at all four factors, the strength, lower limb kinematics, muscle activation, as well as ground reaction force. And uh, surprisingly, there was no link between reduced lower limb strength and patellar femoral pain um, in the study. However, there was uh, some changes in lower limb kinematics. Uh, it showed increased hip abduction adduction, and reduced glute med activation in female runners with patellar femoral pain. There was no link between open chain isometric hip strength and patellar femoral pain. So it's a bit surprising that there's not much of link within strength which is shown in other studies. The second one which we discussed was, which is yet to be published in the Journal of Sports Rehab, is looking at an eight-week multimodal rehab program. So uh, it looked into all the three areas, education, looking at lo load management and uh, symptom management, and looking at strength training and motor control, and also specific gait training for patellar femoral pain. So let's look into the interventions. Looking into the interventions here, we can see... Um, there are, um, uh, on the education, there's specific advice on increasing frequency rather than too much of a distance. So uh, the advice was to decrease the distance. And <clears throat> the um, second was to reduce speed and no downhill running. And during all times of running, the pain was supposed to be kept at 2 out of 10. And the pain should return to baseline within 60 minutes of stopping running. And the exercise was uh, divided into four phases looking into two weeks and the good thing was you didn't have to do it every day it's just thrice a week it's a combination of exercises looking into strength endurance and proximal control which are all mentioned in the appendix section of the journal if there's any specific tightness for the hip flexors or um, other groups then the stretches were incorporated now how about the running retraining so a variety of methods were used um, cadence was increased um, and if it was too loud then there was cues to re uh, reduce the noise, to decrease the ground reaction forces, and a more a midfoot pattern was encouraged. The results were very encouraging. Uh, the problem was one of the key limitations that there's no controls. Uh, there was no change in the lower limb strength. So possibly all the changes and the benefits could be linked with uh, reducing the impact forces as well as uh, the appropriate training advice. So if you want to learn more about moments a screening run-in analysis strength and conditioning you might be interested in our course which we target specifically for management of running courses which is hosted by physio uk in the day one we look into um, uh, screening and all the uh, implications of strength training the day two is a progression into plyometrics um, and running um, analysis and retraining all the links uh, and the web details are on the page and you can visit more if you need further info more I hope you found the webcast useful and thank you for listening.